Okay. Uh, hi, welcome everybody to our garden, uh, our garden village. Uh, this is our first virtual event which brings together a mix of local residents from the South of Ashford Garden community, Ashford Borough Council officers, ward members, parish councillors and professionals in the field of urban planning, de design, conservation, community building, uh, to name but a few uh, of the areas that we have covered today. Um, we are trying something different new. This is the first time we've done an event like this. Um, you can hopefully see me and the other participants in the slides that we're going to um, be showing to us, but sadly we can't see you. Um, so it's a very different event um, that we've got going on here, but we're having some stories that are going to be shared. Some will be shared live, some will be pre-recorded. And we're going to have a summary of the work that's going on at the moment to shape our garden community, our vision for the garden community. And hopefully we'll hear some expert, um, uh, some views from our expert respondents in the room to kickstart the conversation about the places that we're having. This is very much an event about stimulating interest and trying to get involvement in the South of Ashford garden community. And it's very much us in listening mode um, um, to hear the views of the community for people involved about what they think we're trying to do and create here. Um, we do have a survey, um, a have your say survey um, that's open at the moment. I think it's open uh, it's, it's, it's open until the 2nd of October um, and would really much encourage you to participate in that and share your views. Um, today we also have um, a, an opportunity for you to input your questions into the live Q&A box that is, uh, that is available. Um, so your questions should pop up in there. Uh, and we've also got a number of questions and pop up quizzes, um, which there will be links that will be posted in that Q&A box, uh, which will allow, allow you to access and answer those questions throughout the day. So um, without further ado, I want to introduce uh, our Chief Executive, Tracy Curley, to say a few words um, about the garden community. Tracy. Uh, I think you need to. I'm unmuted. I think we might have done that at the same time. Very sorry about that. So yes, I'm Tracy Curley and Chief Executive of Asherborough Council and are working alongside um, the South Ashford Garden community uh, for some years now. Um, and I'm very, very grateful to be part of the event this afternoon. A groundbreaking event for Ashford. So thank you very much for allowing me to be here. I am I'm not able to stay for the whole duration of the event and, and it looks like a really interesting event. Um, but I will get feedback from my colleagues here at Ashford um, as a result of the this afternoon's event. I just so it's a very warm welcome to everybody that's taken the time out to be here today. Um, and this event is uh, I think Ben's just mentioned this is about building stronger communities in Ashford in the context of COVID-19, but also beyond it. And what we can start to do now, which will ensure our existing and new communities have that soft and hard infrastructure needed to better serve the diversity of people who call Ashford their home. Uh, this is such an opportunity to shape a whole new community using the best of how community cohesion works and the best way integration into the wider borough. Uh, and the benefits that brings. I lived on a new community, um, King's Hill in West Morling, and there is a lot of camaraderie about being new and establishing a new neighbourhood and a new community. There is a lot of reliance around, and dare I say, at the school gate and sharing experiences of the new place. Much of the placemaking is being established from people from such different places and backgrounds. So naturally a very diverse community coming from all over the country, many relocating due to connectivity to London, but others just taking the opportunity of a new home and a new location and a new job. The safe environment that was created allowed parents to have a new sense of freedom for their children. So many walks and cycle to school in a safe way. And I would hope that safe family and sharing environment held up well for the COVID crisis there at Kings Hill. These past six months have been devastating for uh, those who've lost jobs, loved ones, and for those who faced with so much uncertainty. It's also been a time of reflection and a time to recognise the inequalities which have always been present, but have been more explicit by this pandemic. We're definitely not out of the woods yet, but based on the way the council pulled together the resources, we did things we'd never done before. We became food distribution depot, communicated daily to support the vulnerable, delivered funding to local groups and organisations, 
set up food delivery to support the shielded, but also the vulnerable and reached out to the isolated. I've no doubt we're better prepared for what's next. There are there are lots of lessons learned from what we did and achieved and not surprisingly is for the first time in my career dealing at the front end the scale of such an emergency that hit the country and the world but actually that's what local authorities are good at and we hope we did reach out in a positive way but the local community is always at the heart of the reality and so important at such a at such a time of crisis opening up again and creating the covid secure environment has been a challenge for us all but something I'm sure will impact on the way this new South Ashford garden community will evolve with this experience to call upon. I hope today we will be just the beginning of sharing stories of coming to grips with the good and the bad of lockdown or of the wider challenges to mourn our losses, but to celebrate our successes. Most of us, uh, most of all, of all, to recognise the new opportunities we have to shape emerging communities such as the Kirkchilminton Green and the South Ashford uh, Garden community. These de developments represent the largest allocation of new housing in our borough, and with that, then significant investment in so much roadways, transport, schools, open spaces community facilities to name just a few. It's critical that we as the council with partners and community members work in collaboration to get this right. This is why the ABC officers are continually seeking involvement of community members to help shape the garden village to ensure it becomes a place which reflects the community it serves. So with this in mind, I look forward to hearing some of the stories today and the discussions that follow. Thank you. And over to you. OK, thank you, Tracy. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, certainly it's been a, been a tremendous uh, period uh, for us in the local authority. I don't think I've ever been proud of um, who we work for and what we've achieved as, a, as an authority. It's been amazing of the last six months. Um, I think we have our first poll, which I'm reliably informed is supposed to be a fun poll to allow us to just check that it works um, and test it works. So I think there should be within um, the Q&A piece a my questions bit that we can actually kind of um, then access and um, do the poll. Right. So this this first video is is from from resident uh, Emily Bradford, who works for the NHS, and she's talking a bit about her experience during lockdown. Hello everyone, my name is Emily. I'm 22 years old and I live in Shaddockshurst um, and I work full time for the NHS as an engagement officer and usually I travel all around Kent meeting up with people with various communication needs to help them better access our healthcare services um, and luckily during lockdown I've been able to keep my job which is really good considering that so many other people were furloughed or even lost their jobs like some of my friends so i'm really glad that i was able to keep my job and the only difference for me was that i was working from home which was in itself a very interesting experience when you're living and working in the same place um, i'm at a point now where i can go into the office uh, once a week when we're able to socially distance as a team because i can only do about 80 percent of my job at home um, but given the announcement from the government that we've had this week it's likely that i'll go back to working from home full time um, and just thinking about the positives and the negatives that i've had during then um, probably the main negative has been uh, the unreliability of technology and Wi-Fi and thinking about what a community needs in a situation like this and in an uncertain future it's really important that we have reliable and efficient Wi-Fi and networks and technology and when I'm working from home I really rely on using my work laptop and my work mobile phone and it's very frustrating when some days I have no Wi-Fi at all or really slow internet and I often I'm on the phone to a member of public but I'm walking around the house trying to find a good enough signal so that's something I found quite frustrating um, and something that's really important going forward in a generation like this and in a very interesting uh, change of um, what we might see. But thinking about the positives, for me personally, I've really been able to um, access the outdoors and go to some really um, awesome open spaces. I've been taking my dogs to nature reserves, to woods, yeah. to and even to the beach sometimes and because I haven't been commuting or having to travel around Kent and I've been able to just work my eight hours with no distractions at, at home 
um, I've got more time to be able to do that. So I've really that's been really great for my health and well-being and for my physical fitness as well. Um, and I think it's really important that we all as a community have access to those public spaces because I have the luxury of having a car. Um, but for some people, um, the kind of spaces that I've been going to are inaccessible without having a car. So then thinking about what a community needs, it's going to be really good, reliable uh, public transport links and footpaths and cycle paths. And another negative that I've experienced, even though I've had time to have so much exercise and use these outdoor spaces, I live on uh, Tally High Road, which is a, at the moment a 30 mile an hour road. But not only do people ignore the speed limit and go really fast down there, but there's no footpath at all. So you're limited to a very narrow verge. And that's that's even too narrow for myself. But when I'm walking with two dogs, it really limits the space to be able to walk safely down that road. And every single day that I walk my dogs down there, I have to squeeze myself into a hedge or get down into a ditch. because It's really unsafe and people are really unaware um, of giving way to pedestrians. So in order to have a safe environment and accessible to amenities and open spaces, we really need to have footpaths and also cycle paths. The reason we don't have that many cyclists on the road is because it's unsafe to do so. So if you put these provisions in place, then people are more likely to use them and it's cheaper to buy a bike than it is to buy a car. And especially with the communities that I work with, a lot of people can't afford to buy or run a car. So public transport is really important and um, being able to safely walk to the shops in in a in a short distance is really important because technically I could walk to Tesco's it'd be about a 25 minute walk but in reality that's on 30 and 40 mile an hour roads with no pavement so I can't safely do that so just to recap then um, what's important for a community reliable and efficient technology and wi-fi being able to access open spaces which is going to be really good for people's health and well-being and mental health um, and obviously it's going to be a free activity so thinking of like how to make a community affordable somewhere affordable to live um, and having really good public transport links so you're able to get into town the luxury of where i live in shaddockshurst is is a five minute drive to ashford town where i could do my shopping but five minutes the other way I can go to the woods. So there's a really good balance of where we live, but people need to be able to access those, access those without a car. So public transport, cycle pass and foot pass. So thank you for listening to what I have to say. Sorry I couldn't be there in person as I do work full time. Um, but yeah, have a great day. OK, and we have one more video from Councillor Heather Hayward. I'll bring that up now. Hi, I'm Councillor Heather Hayward and I'm part of the Lyons Community Garden. During the lockdown, we've been able to open our doors to so many families Audio. that were isolating in a controlled manner. So they had exclusive use of the garden and they were able to come and do activities. And I'm going to talk you through some of the things that our local community have benefited from using this facility. The hotel was built by a family. Um, the mum phoned me um, in almost to the point of desperation, she'd been in lockdown with her seven children in a three bedroomed house and was pulling her hair out because they hadn't left the house for so long. Um, so we arranged for them to come to the garden just for them. No one else was here and they built us a bug hotel um, and they had a great time. Came back for another day and painted our pallet benches for us. We also had various volunteers coming in separately during lockdown and they built our pallet planters and also planted vegetables for us. Ted from Kings North Parish Council and his son came during lockdown and between them had a father and son activity of planting this planter for us, which um, was a, I think it was originally a paving slab um, crate, but that's now our planter and then we grew some lovely sunflowers in it. But during lockdown, the Lives Community Garden has really benefited from people coming in from the local community and also the other way around. The community has seen a massive benefit. We've had families coming here who've never done anything in the open space before, enjoying it, working together in a safe and controlled way. And I really think that the Garden Village, the South of Ashford Garden Community, 
could really do with its own facility just like this. Okay. <clears throat> wow, thank you, Dan. Uh, technical hitches aside, there were two brilliant videos. Um, and I, for me, I think the standout is understanding the importance of access to quality open space. Um, and that's certainly that. So certainly my experience of lockdown was very much kind of like valuing the importance of having quality open space that that we can access. And certainly my family and I was, was spent a lot of time walking in the orchards uh, near where I live. Um, and I think lockdown brought in a whole load of new challenges that I think we didn't really uh, know how we'd respond to. But um, I think I, I actually now miss the fact that we had virtual cubs on a Tuesday in our household and listening to the, the various treasure hunts that we had around the house and the various things that we had to do and exercises. Um, the, 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 the scouting movement um, were, were amazing with how they actually put on um, virtual cubs and that actually really kept my daughter connected to, to her pack. And that was brilliant. Um, and my community, um, we also had our Borton Village snake as well, where um, all the children were encouraged to decorate pebbles and add them to um, to the village snake. Um, and, and now we've actually got a permanent public art installation in our village um, of our snake called around a lamppost. And it's brilliant. And I think they were, they were ways that the uh, community could come together really well over um, over Facebook actually and put that together. So that was that was wonderful. Um, and now I think we're moving on to having some short stories um, from residents, uh, uh, local residents who are going to share their experiences of lockdown and how they adapted. Um, I think we've got Pete uh, first, who's uh, a Kings North res resident um, and is going to share his experience. So can I invite you to, to speak, Pete? Thanks, Ben. Can everyone hear me OK? Yeah, perfect. perfect. OK, so my name's Pete. Uh, I've been a resident of Kings North for the past 12 years. Uh, and I live just outside the proposed uh, Kings North Green development uh, down Steeds Lane. Uh, for the past 15 months, uh, I've been the, in the post of Kings North Parish Manager. Um, so I work for the Parish Council. So I have a perspective from both uh, sides of the fence, uh, as to, so to say. Firstly, I'd like to give you a few uh, thoughts and reflections on lockdown in Kings North um, from a personal perspective. Um, in the face of a worldwide pandemic, uh, life as we all knew it changed uh, overnight. Uh, but I'd just like to highlight some of the positives of lockdown. Uh, and obviously this links in directly to the south of Ashford Garden community. The first thing that I kind of wrote down, because I've got some notes here because I made a made a bit of an effort, uh, was the peace and quiet. Um, it provided us all, um, obviously working from home and homeschooling. Uh, we noticed that the number of vehicles using our roads decreased dramatically, um, which resulted in some peace uh, and some quiet, but also the opportunity for us to explore the parish without the worry of traffic and speeding cars. So living down a rural road uh, without any footpaths um, having less cars on the road uh, was great because I could walk down the road with my son and my wife uh, without the worry of someone speeding down there at 60 miles an hour. Um, also, it gave us the opportunity uh, to explore the amazing environment that we live in. Kings North is, or should I say was, uh, a rural part of Ashford. And we now have so many open spaces and wildlife that live alongside us. Many residents made the use of the Kings North buffer zone uh, and also the playing fields, along with various bridleways, footpaths and cycle routes. Uh, many of these people found uh, that they've never been used before because lockdown, lockdown gave them the opportunity. Um, finally, the last thing reflection on, on the positive side uh, was time. You know, the lockdown gave us time to reflect on what is important to us uh, and to our local community. Um, it gave us time with our families um, and our friends, although it could be virtually, and also time to ourselves. Um, so as a resident, I'd just like to say and ask the planners, the developers, if there's any listening, and also the borough council, uh, just to consider the current residents that are living within the South Ashford Garden community uh, when designing the new developments and making sure that the impact on the current residents is limited because although it is going to be a new community with lots of new residents, 
the current residents are as important, if not more important. Um, from a parish council point of view, obviously everything changed. Um, during lockdown, the parish council sort of changed its role, um, similar to the borough council. We provided support to the local community by providing uh, support to local isolated residents and those that were shielding. Residents provided, um, you know, ad hoc, we provided ad hoc support, such as picking up prescriptions, shopping, being there as a friendly voice if someone was lonely. Uh, we helped coordinate a number of volunteers across the parish who helped and stepped in to support uh, those in need. If there's anything or there's one thing uh, that I'd like to, everyone that's listening to this to take away from today is that now more than ever, the local community is key to our success, uh, whether it's as a country, as a county, as a borough or as a local neighbourhood. So please make sure when we're building these new communities, that we build on the existing community spirit uh, and use this to drive forward any future development. Thank you. That's wonderful. Uh, uh, Dan, Dan, are you going off? Are you doing something now immediately? <laughs> I just so, I'd say thank you to Pete for that. I thought that was a really wonderful insight. Um, I, I, I thought that was really, really interesting. And I think the, the, that key takeaway for me there is about the integration between the new and the old community and how do we get that right when we, whenever we uh, look to build that new community and how do we capture that spirit? I thought that was a, a really wonderful takeaway. So thank you very much for that. Dan. Um, I'm going to say that we should jump ahead to Ian Wolverson's presentation. Um, which is in a video format, and I'll just queue that up now. Um, and in the meantime, I'll continue my efforts to bring the other other two speakers into the room. OK, thank you, Dan. So this video is is uh, was kindly put together by uh, resident Chillington resident Ian Wilberson. Um, I'll let it speak for itself. What do we understand by a community? Is it just about living in the same locality, just a neighbourhood? Surely it's more than that. It's about sharing, a feeling of membership. It's being involved. There's always immediate involvement if food and drink are on offer. And our dances seem to attract all age groups. And creating a community plan encourages people to come along, have their say, put their sticker on the wall and see if it yields any results. Unity really is being involved. The community in Great Chart celebrated the Queen's Jubilee with a street party and a tug of war. The airfield at Chilmington, known as RAF Ashford, was built by RAF 5003 Engineering Squadron and was used by Canadians and Americans during the D-Day operations. As the centenary of the First World War and the anniversary of the departure of the Americans to their new site in Free France after D-Day occurred on almost the same day of the year, it was decided we'd hold a grand commemorative weekend with an exhibition and a commemorative ceremony and the unveiling of new memorials. Presentations were watched on borrowed wobbly display screens. At the memorial, we witnessed the unveiling of a plaque to 15 RAF engineers killed at their camp. And on the right, we saw Bernie Sledzik, age 90, return from the United States to unveil the RAF Ashford Memorial to the 25 servicemen lost. RAF 5003 Engineering Squadron had a new standard and they chose to lay their old one up in St Mary's and adopt the church as their own. Not to be outdone, the Americans sent their own standard to be laid up in St Mary's as well. 
Year six from four primary schools attended memorial service to the seven men of the village lost during the Battle of the Somme. The flag at half mast in the centre remembers Private Tucked killed on the first day. And at the bottom of the left hand flag at the back are Tucked's relatives who came here specially to take part in the service. Those of you with a keen eye might notice the middle flag on the left is flying upside down. Yet another young group of people keen to take part in these memorial services were the ATC cadets of 305 Squadron Ashford. Here they are parading 5003 Squadron Standard as the veterans felt they weren't steady enough to parade them themselves. On the centenary of his death, each serviceman from the parish was remembered at the village war memorial. With the ever increasing size of audiences and the widening interest throughout the Ashford community, it was decided borrowing wobbly AV screens was no longer satisfactory and we raised funds to install a professional AV system allowing greater flexibility. Suddenly the most wonderful unsolicited gifts started appearing. An increasing number of scouting groups were now attending our events from across the borough. They came because the parade was safe and they always found a friendly welcome. In St Mary's, Great Chart's British Legion standard had been joined by three different squadron flags from three different nations. And the very day before the Rule of Six came into operation, Ashford RAF Cadet 305 Squadron chose to hold their Battle of Britain Memorial at the War Memorial in Great Chart. It's quite clear from these events that many non-church going members of the community see St Mary's as a place of great dignity and which contains much of our local heritage. The PCC have courageously recognised that attendances at church services are continuing to fall, but that some events attract great numbers. But a grade one building is expensive and needs to be occupied for more than a couple of hours a week. The PCC have taken the decision to repair and upgrade the church in a manner that will allow its use by the wider community. The PCC's Jason project has been set up to raise funding. Amongst other upgrades, the Victorian pews will be removed. They were only installed in the 1870s, so St Mary's has spent most of its time without pews. All the errors in yellow on this plan are released for multiple purposes. This will bring much flexibility back into the building for events such as concerts, plays, exhibitions, seminars, a cinema club, local shows and social events, farmers markets and so on. All of this will take place whilst maintaining the dignity of the building as a place of worship and continuing refuge for our heritage. And the little pest priest house down by the church gate will have an installation in place for storing all our local records, thus truly completing St Mary's heritage role. Our experience here in Great Chart shows that it is involvement that makes the community, not the other way round. This sets quite a challenge for the Chilmington CMO and the South Ashford Garden community. Those who should be involved have not yet moved in. So it's important that the established surrounding communities become involved. Time to use what we already have. The Singleton Environment Centre and St Mary's to name just two. All right.
Okay, uh, well, um, I don't know if Ian's on the call, but thank you, Ian, for a very informative uh, presentation. There, I actually I learned something about the little uh, the little priest house, and that's actually quite a delightful um, a, a delightful thing at the, uh, at the just at the entrance. And certainly um, in the town itself, we had a similar um, project looking at, at the St Mary's in the in the town centre about how we can actually change or, or repurpose its use and bring it back to um, a more wider community use and it's actually been a real success um, and has actually transformed the the, 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 the attendance and use of, the, uh, of that space and I, I, I'm sure that the St Mary's in Great Chart project will have just to use. I think a real uh, um, takeaway there is I think he's uh, I think Ian closed by sort of saying involvement makes local uh, a local community um, and I think that's that that's a, that's that's a real key takeaway and certainly during Covid I noticed that just actually talking stopping and talking to people in the street socially distanced of course was much you know was much more welcome that human contact I think you know in, in a sense our, our horizons narrowed um, because of our because because of the uh, the lockdown, and I think that actually brought us uh, brought local community into more focus than the time you spend with neighbours, um, and more important. And certainly, a friend of mine in an, in another village, he had a um, in his court, his close that they, he lives in, they had a um, they had an afternoon tea sort of once a week where they all sat out in the court in front of their houses and had a chat and a cup of tea and a discussion. And that's something they've actually kept going. It's been quite a wonderful thing. Um, and actually they've really made their community as a result of that. OK, so that next uh, Q&A should be up for the next uh, sort of five, uh, five tw 10 minutes, shouldn't it, I think? Um, well, I think so then what we'll do is we'll leave them live so that so that there isn't a time limit just to give people an opportunity. OK, right. Wonderful. Now, I think that slide means that we should be going on to item four. Um, and I'm going to introduce Sal, who's going to set the context for this, because um, this is very much a sally Ann slide, I think. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to you, sally Ann. Thank you, Ben. Um, hello to everybody. My name is sally Ann Logan. Uh, I work for the Borough Council as um, the Chilmington Green or the South Ashford Garden Community um, Coordinator for the, for the Council and our partners. And I'm also the Chief Executive of the Chilmington Management Organisation. Um, and I've been involved with Chilmington Green for a long time now, um, eight years um, were quite deeply involved and even before that in terms of some of the Greater Ashford Development Framework uh, sessions that happened at um, Eastwell Manor many, many years ago. So long history with being involved in this project and, and the community and you know I loved what we've heard this afternoon from Ian and Pete because um, they epitomised the fabulous communities that we've got surrounding this site. And they give us a, um, an absolutely wonderful um, starting point for developing a new community and embracing the new with the existing. So I just wanted to take a moment to to think about what is garden, what is a garden community, um, what what does that mean to this project, and and how are we going to take um, forward a vision and strategy? And then I'll pass to Alison, who's going to talk a little bit more about the focus groups that we've been doing with some of you over the past three weeks or so. So in 2019, um, we were given garden community status um, by central government. Um, and what does that mean? I can hear you say, well, what that means is that the, the borough council gets some capacity funding to underpin um, and put greater emphasis and resource towards making sure that the community that we create is sustainable. Uh, it's a high quality place to live. It has good access to open space um, and mobility. Um, has good governance in terms of the governance of the community into the future and the stewardship um, and many, many other things which have already been mentioned this afternoon. Um, so what we're doing is placing a focus on those things um, in terms of um, community involvement that goes to the heart of what a community, a garden community is. And um, we are very passionate about doing that from the very earliest point and, and we have been doing that for a long time. What we need to bring into play is some more people um, from the existing community and it's great to see some here today to start getting involved and having a say on how we shape um, the garden community uh, to benefit new and existing residents. So um, we're creating a vision, vision and strategy um, for, for very simple purposes, which is, you know, this is this is a large scale development of um, three um, three different development sites, 7,250 homes, and we need something that holds us um, holds us together, 
that it's something that is owned by the community, but also owned by the borough council, the county council, our developer partners, Homes England, um, and always coming back to the residents themselves. And by creating a strategy, it gives us some aspiration and vision for what we're going to achieve. We're looking to the next five years, but no doubt um, we will be looking beyond that as well, because this is a very long term project. We're talking 20 to 30 years here build out. So without further ado, if I can hand to Alison um, and she's going to talk a little bit about what was said by the community in the focus groups um, and to add value to the great videos that we've already heard. Thank you. Hi, welcome everybody. Um, we held three focus groups and out of those groups came these five emerging themes and you've already heard from some of the presentations these themes being echoed in what people have been saying. So I'm just going to give you some of the ideas that came out under each of the themes and the idea is that you think about them, um, you give some views as to whether or not you think they're good ideas or how we can then take them forward because with the consultation is still open, isn't it Dan, until the 2nd of October for this particular phase? That's correct. Yeah, and then of course, as, as Sally Ann has already said, this is not a project that's going to end over overnight. It's got a long, long life and we need to start developing some of these themes. So the first one I want to pick up is flexible and accessible spaces. Um, this is a live project. It's going to be going for many, many years and what is suitable now will change over the life of the project. And so what we're looking at is how some of those facilities can be flexible during the life of, of the project. Um, and so, for example, sports facilities shouldn't be maybe one sport focus. They should be flexible in their use. Um, we've been looking at how you might want to have car parks that you have to have um, for people to travel to sports facilities, but how maybe they can be designed from the start with permeable surfaces, um, with low level lighting and that maybe some of those spaces can have a dual function. The other thing that came out of COVID, which was really interesting and maybe now the new norm, is that not many people actually use physical pavilions for changing. They change outside. Um, and so maybe what we need needing to, to do is look at whether or not we need what are called boot, boot benches where you can change into your kit by the side of the pitch. Um, where you can actually have lockers, where you can lock yourself, your, your, your kit up somewhere safe while you're playing a game, but not necessarily be going into a physical pavilion. We need to be starting to think differently, and I think lockdown has given us that reflection that we might want to do that slightly differently. Um, the other one that we wanted to pick up, and this has already been referred to, is local connectivity. This isn't just good for people and safe walking routes and cycle routes. This is good for flora and fauna as well. That lovely picture that Sally Ann put up shows how important these three developments are because they are physically linked and we need to make sure that those linkages that are already there are improved or protected, that there are safe walking routes, safe connectivity um, and that that is enshrined in, in the vision that we have. Um, we also need to be looking at um, that some of these things need to be early wins, that we shouldn't be waiting for some of these walking areas to be done at the end of the development, that some of them should be put in at the beginning and that some of them may well be temporary in nature, that they are temporary safe walking routes as the development progresses, because if you wait for perfection, we could be waiting 15 odd years um, for that to actually come through. So we're talking about wildlife corridors as well as safe walking routes for people. And there are existing footpaths and there are existing opportunities that we need to keep identifying and building onto. We've already made that link between um, health and well-being and how important our open spaces are and how important they have been during lockdown. So again, when we're designing our open spaces, we need to have that in mind. It's not just about marching from one place to another. We need to think about some pause points destination points, what we want to do when we get to a lake, a pond, a wood, an orchard, sitting, using, that kind of stuff. So we need to be thinking about the well-being aspects and also how we can link that into maybe the health facilities that we have. Um, community ownership, and obviously this is at the heart of the um, community management organisation at Chilmington. That in order to be in control of your destiny, you may well need to be involved in that, how that 
is managed and shaped in the future. So one of the options, either through the CMO or through smaller organisations, is how can the community be, be involved in the management and the shaping of the community spaces that we're talking about? And it could be from a small thing like a community garden. It could be like a social enterprise project where we set up some gardening cooperatives, we produce local food all the way through to various recreational activities. But if you want to build the community, as Ian had already shown in, in, the, in his lovely um, video, we need to engage people. It can't just be a presentation from, if you like, the suits and the planners. It needs to be what the community feels is important and how they can be participating in that. So some of the things that I think could be really interesting as we are talking about open space is what we mean by the definitions of that open space, because we are a lot of our land here is, is built in, in, on a flood area or we need to be talking about water mitigation. So what are we going to use that water for? Is it just going to be for a scrape in a dog pond or is it going to actually have a more formal function? And one of the things that we might want to be considering is how that open space adds value to other things like monitoring and, and, um, and mitigating pollution, be it sound levels, be it um, um, carbon monoxide from traffic or whatever. We need to be thinking how that space works for itself. Building community value, um, local centres, um, these should be there not necessarily at the end of when the housing development is done, but right at the beginning so it can actually help to provide that space for the community to develop. Um, we want to look at some of the district, um, the distinct characters of the various places so that they are not all lost and maybe how they can be built up and you can create smaller communities from within. Uh, and I think it's already been picked up that the existing community is important and it will be that existing community that welcomes the new people moving into the area. Those are the key things. I think, Dan, have I kept time? Am I all right? You're all right for time, yep. OK, so those were kind of some of the thoughts. Um, clearly, this was just the start of the conversation. Um, for those of you who did attend those focus groups, did I miss anything out? Uh, I believe the full notes, Dan, will, are, are likely to be available, aren't they? Yes. Um, Alison, did you want to? We had some questions yep. to pose to the audience here. Okay, jokes. Are you? And what well, I wasn't sure, Dan, are you able to take them now on your little chat line? Oh yeah, that that is a part of the program. So we will take some questions through the Q and A following um, following your presentation. We do have a couple other speakers that we want to get through, um, so and then we will take. Do you want to do that now, or do you want me to keep them till the end? Because one of the things that we wanted to talk about was the building of the local involvement. Uh, so as I've said, these are the ideas that were put through by the focus groups. And yep. what really interesting to know is whether the people participating today like them, didn't like them, would like to add to them. And some obvious ones where you, we need to understand if they're going to work because we could be very aspirational, but actually it will never be achieved for a whole variety of reasons. Um, and we need to make sure that things are deliverable, that there is an element of it being um, it, it is within the art of the possible. And I think for me, this is the most important one, which is the latter, which is what role can you as individuals play? Not just now by participating in what we're talking about today, because this is just the beginning of the journey. It's how you would like to be involved all the way through and at a level that you would find comfortable because not everybody wants to attend forums and meetings and committees. Some people just like to do the doing. And I think we need to break down some of these actions into that that kind of, if you like, level of how people might want to participate. OK, so I'm happy Very to take good. questions or we can pick it up in the Q&A later. Thank you, Alison. Dan, do we do some questions at the moment? Um, I think we have a, we have a, sp a space in in the agenda for some questions if you want. So if, if there's no further questions for now, let's let's hear from from um, let's go to hear from from Nikki since since we are on that topic of um, uh, of wildlife and and of preservation of natural habitats. So that might be a good a good segue for us. Um, in the meanwhile, I hope more are. Um, willing to post questions as we go along. Great, thanks Dan. So um, yeah, like you say, segueing on from um, 
sort of what Alison's just said and touching on uh, Leslie's comment, but I also feel like it's really positive that so much of this conversation, um, almost all of our speakers at some point have touched on the importance of green spaces, open spaces and access to nature. So that's a really sort of great start to lead me in. Um, so I guess just by way of introduction, um, my name's Nikki and I am a Wilder Towns Officer at Kent Wildlife Trust. So thank you for having me um, join this webinar today. Um, and so just a little bit around what I tend to do, which is um, as a Wilder Towns Officer, I sort of work with my team to try and make sure that our new and existing urban spaces are wildlife friendly, but also that everyone has access to wildlife in their local area. Um, and so sort of a key issue that we are facing at the moment is sort of trying to ensure that wildlife isn't just protected from development, but the habitats are properly enhanced and restored, created and connected throughout the landscape. So we want to sort of create these corridors of high quality habitat throughout our urban environments to allow wildlife to recover and thrive and also to engage people with nature. Um, and I, as we've heard from quite a few of our speakers already, um, that it's, it's well known the benefits, both um, mental and physical health and well-being that people can benefit from their engagement in nature. So, um, and I think another one of the key themes, um, well, so the, the two key themes that sort of stood out for me and what people have been saying and from the take home messages from those focus groups is around community spirit and sort of valuing the community and um, that sort of wanting to get outside more and connecting to nature. Um, and that's been a real key theme throughout lockdown um, and the fact that all of these have been brought to this webinar today shows that everyone wants that to sort of continue and flourish into the future. Um, so and I, I guess everyone else has shared their own reflections and I'd love to share mine as well as um, during lockdown I'm another one of those people who I would tend to travel further afield to go and walk in um, nature reserves and sort of travel down to coastal sites. But during lockdown in our one hour um, daily exercise, I was exploring new areas near my home, sort of new woodland areas. And for me, I found that really beneficial, but also got me thinking about how whilst we've got these little ribbons of um, habitat um, running through our urban areas when we're planning for the future can we try and plan to make these ribbons of habitat of a much higher quality and sort of steering away from focusing on um, sort of amenity grassland verge areas and things so it's just sort of little bits of food for thought to sort of take forward into um, into sort of the design of these new communities and things um so i think when there's been so so many great comments i'm trying to think of sort of what would be most beneficial to touch on in terms of where examples of work that kent wildlife trust has been doing could maybe be taken forward whether that be or sort of community led or supported by organizations to help support um, these sort of new communities in achieving these values that they want in community spirit and connecting to nature. So um, my colleagues, um, some people on this call may know um, some of my colleagues in the States, Ian and Christina, who do a lot of work already with the local community, um, particularly sort of taking volunteers out up at Conningbrook Lakes, um, getting people involved in on the ground habitat management and creating really tight knit groups of volunteers as they go. So really giving people that physical exercise, but also that sort of mental stimulation. And I know that that was really missed during lockdown. And um, now that they're all back out and sanitising all of their tools, um, everyone seems much happier <laughs> um, now that they're able to get back out in the environment. Um, but that's not, um, but as well as that, we've got 
uh, projects across Ashford. Um, previously, there was the Ashford Meadows project where uh, we were working with local communities to get um, to and, and this is to sort of retrofit areas of um, wildflower meadow into local parklands and working with local schools to create wildflower uh, sort of um, wildlife areas. But it would be really great if these could be things that we start off with rather than sort of retrofitting into local parks and schools. We could start off with that from day one, um, which would be um, which would be fantastic. And then getting sort of local people and children on board with sort of the management and the educational value of these places. Um, and I think one sort of. I guess what one other project that might be worth touching on, and um, this is something that I would love to be where I live at home, um, is a project that we've been doing, not in Ashford, I'm afraid, but um, in Tunbridge Wells, it, a sort of a new development. And I think one of the things we're all very used to in these new developments is management companies taking on the management of the green spaces within this area. So whether that's cutting the grass and uh, maintaining some of the um, the suds ponds, the um, the drainage ponds. Um, but in, so in this instance, this this new development has a um, community strategy that was very wildlife uh, focused and driven, but putting that into practice seemed like a bit of a challenge. So um, my um, colleagues at uh, Kent Wildlife Trust were able to work with the developer and with the management company to draw up not just a management, uh, a site management plan for cutting the grass, but for actually delivering a conservation management plan to protect the green corridor on site and all other areas of habitat throughout site. Because a lot of these, um, in a lot of instances, sometimes it can just be lack of awareness as to sort of knowing how to manage a habitat for wildlife. And that's something that was um, for managing recreational areas and amenity grassland might not be sort of so important. But for these wildlife corridors, this is where sort of real expertise that sort of we're able to input and um, other wildlife organisations can input as uh, sort of really um, invaluable. Um, and as well as doing that, it's sort of keeping on top of that management plan and making sure that we're doing quarterly visits to make sure that we're on track. And if anything needs changing, that can be implemented. But another um, on the flip side of that and the other side of that project was around community engagement. Um, and this again was driven by that community action plan. So um, a whole suite of events that included things from uh, wildlife gardening workshops, uh, especially when people first moved in and they're, they've got a blank canvas, what are they going to do with their gardens? So if from the outset we've got workshops that are encouraging gardens to be wildlife friendly and people can they sort of build that sense of community around working together to achieve um, sort of achieve what's been set out in these workshops as well as specific workshops for children, including sort of nature trail days and I'm a conservationist and things like that. And um, maybe these are the sort of um, sort of projects that could be built in from the beginning of all new developments so that this isn't just like a nice case study that we can discuss, but this is just the norm. Um, I'd certainly like that myself. Um, and I could really go on and on, but I should probably um, <laughs> I, I should probably let um, other people chip in and I'm happy to answer questions as best I can in, in the Q&A session at the end. That's brilliant. Thank you, Nikki. Um, I, interestingly, Alison and I are both um, director trustees of the uh, Children to Management Organisation um, and Sal's the chief exec of it. Um, and uh, we're, we're the organisation that will have these open spaces entrusted to it um, to, to maintain and look after. Um, and I think that it's interesting what you say about creating wildlife friendly um, uh, spaces um, and allowing people to have the access. But I think it, it, there's a bit of a tension that gets created there between 
the resident who pays their management charge and may may expect to see neatly manicured grass versus the desire to create a habitat. I just wonder whether you have any idea on how we can balance those two um, those two desires. I think that is a real a, a shift, almost a societal shift that I think we will start to move through. And I think it's I should make it. I should sort of make it quite clear that it's not that we want to let give every area of the development over to wildlife. Of course, there's certain areas, whether that's um, sort of sports pitches, specific recreation grounds and um, sort of recreation areas that, yes, we accept that you would want to be managing that as more sort of amenity grassland, shortcut grassland to allow those those activities and for people to enjoy that area. But there's also then the educational side that while well, we're letting these areas um, grow up and that means that in spring we're going to have these lovely wildlife um, wildflower areas in um, sort of autumn. We're going to have these lovely berries and you're going to have a flood of um, birds in your local area and you'll have um, increased numbers of pollinators and they're seeing the beauty in that um, which you don't get from short mown grass and that's just something that is drilled into our psyche which can be quite frustrating from an uh, ecological point of view and that's not to say it doesn't have its place but it's finding the balance and I think what Leslie was saying was sort of really important in that there's going to be certain areas of these developments and I think when I've looked at the plans that are sort of set aside as almost rewilding areas and so in such small areas there's probably going to need to be some level of management involved so why don't we bring the local community on board so that they can have an understanding of and an involvement in um, whether it's overseeing livestock or um, and sort of managing these areas so it's, it, it is finding a balance and I think education is probably the best way forward with that like I was saying with these um, sort of community engagement plans and events especially starting with um, sort of starting with that local community is the best way forward I don't know whether that answers your question at all <laughs> Well, there's probably not. A, there's, it does actually. I, I think for me, it's about that managing the expectations, and we are at the beginning of establishing that community. And um, yeah. I think it's about how we can establish, build those expectations, and actually try to create an expectation that neatly mown grass is what not what you're looking for, but actually a, a, a diverse wildlife habitat, which yeah. is encouraging bird life and other uh, and other forms of uh, of wildlife is 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 what we expect in in some of these yeah. open spaces, and actually uh, not have it imprinted that we are expecting it to be a a neatly mown piece of grass. I think, no, I think um, that's where um, interpretation and boards and things can really come into their own. Um, and when I walk around Ashford, we've got um, a Wilder Kent Award scheme and there are certain uh, local residents and in groups and they have basically given over parts of their garden over to wildlife. And almost in order to combat that stigma, that so there's lots of signs up saying this is a pollinator garden, this is X, Y, Z. And then that means that when you look at it, you can appreciate the beauty of that for nature conservation. And so that's just on a small scale. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a lot about education because from my point of view, I'll um, look out and see our management company mowing our road verges to within an inch of their life. And, and I find that <laughs> I, I might look at that completely different to someone else. So, mm. yeah. yeah, OK, that's, thank you. That's really interesting. And I think, you know, I think you're right. It's getting those um, th those explainers out there and, and building that awareness. And that's something that the um, CMO, the, the, the management organisation um, can be can be working on and trying to develop. And I think Alison and I are probably going to take that on board and try and take that back to base on that one. Um, does that then bring us to Liz, who's a partner at Lee Evans Partnership, to have um, to, to give her um, initial reactions um, on the content and what we've uh, had and um, to share some of her experiences? Thanks, Ben. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Um, I was just saying uh, as, as we started this that um, I was lucky enough yesterday to be on a regional call about garden communities. Um, and. So this is a it's really, really interesting to hear everybody's views, all of which I completely agree with. 
I've been lucky enough to be working in Ashford for a very long time now, probably about 15 years, and particularly have done a lot of work on the Chilmington Master Plan. I tend to advise on design and placemaking for people's homes and how to make homes as, as good as they can possibly be. Um, one of the things that was raised at the thing I was at yesterday, which is a real advantage for this garden village, is the benefit of creating a garden community that is an extension to an already existing place. One of the really big difficulties is when you have to start from a completely blank canvas in the middle of nowhere. And I think something that's really positive here, which is the point that Peter um, raised, is the issue of integrating with current residents. And the videos and the, um, um, the input given by the people at the beginning was absolutely fantastic and exactly what is needed here, because what we have is already a lot of very good communities for, for the new garden village to tap into. Um, and this is an opportunity for this garden village to be absolutely what a garden community can be, to really embody all the things about the natural environment and the quality of life and everything, which a lot of which is there to be tapped into and to be extended onto and make this a real legacy opportunity for the whole of Ashford, but particularly for this area, um, because there is a lot of the, there's a lot to draw on and there's a lot of people here who are already very much active as part of the local community that can be part of the new community. It's not all going to suddenly appear in one go. Um, a very interesting point that was raised was about setting footpaths in place quite early on for people to start engaging with the area. I think that's really interesting. My take on it um, as a partner in an architect's practice is, is obviously all about creating the master plan and creating the homes. And the thing that I always say is that the best and most desirable homes are the ones that are in the best location. And what I would say to you is, as you start this, is take on board all the things that people have said, think about the communities that are already there and really integrate with them because you're lucky that you've got them there as a starting point, which is really, really good. But also all the things that Nikki said about the quality of environment and the, the lockdown stories about well-being and exercise, that can start from day one and then create those great places put them into your master plan and then put your houses there. And that will mean that you will create places where people will really want to come and live. They're not going to be just some houses. This is going to be a place that could be a real legacy for, for the future of Ashford. And all the time you've got all this really rich input from people. Um, the homes that will be created will be absolutely excellent. And I think this is a really exciting opportunity. Chilmington, we worked really hard very early on trying to get a master plan that really started to work and the way that this is now going to connect into it, I think is a really really positive thing and I would love to stay involved so thank you very much Dan for inviting me thank you Ben for your excellent chairing and um, really great to see so much participation and I won't be very long because I'm conscious of time thanks everyone Wonderful. Thank you Liz um, I, I, it's, it's interesting because I do think um, lockdown does kind of create a focus on design and or has created, created a focus on design and how, how you actually create spaces that people want to go and spend time and dwell and actually how you do that in a, in a safe way and I think it also challenges us to think about the design of our own properties and our own uh, our own spaces that we're creating so I think it's been a really interesting challenge um, I think for me I think um, we've had a lot of uh, a lot of talk about how we engage with um, the existing community and um, the new community uh, and we did try to do some resident surveys in the CMO recently um, and sadly COVID meant that we had to do it digitally which um, you know, presented its opportunities and its challenges. Um, but I think it's really sort of like thinking about um, just a question to the panel is really about how we can support those digitally excluded members of the community um, and it, how we can help them go about their um, go about their daily lives, but still feel engaged um, uh, in, in, in an era when we have increased digital engagement. I just wonder if anyone had any th th thoughts on that. Come on, Sal, you've always got an opinion on this. There's also lots of questions in the Q&A that we could also go to as well to try to address. Do you want to bring a few of those in then, Dan? Um, yeah. And I, I can see that 
Artemis has been has been responding to some of them already. Um, let's see. I think um, Christina's popped in one there about green cycle corridors are the key um, uh, for this development. I think that's uh, that that is really important. Um, uh, at the moment, uh, it's getting that connectivity, isn't it, between the the community with, that we're creating and the town. I think there's a few barriers that are, that, that are in place, but I think um, the pipeline is for those to, ha to, to 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 be provided, and the developer will have to provide those um, those corridors. But I think that does present a challenge um, to those uh, those people moving on to the Chilmington site at the moment. I know Sally Ann and I were going to um, uh, encourage an officer to talk to um, the developer about providing some form of temporary um, uh, access or, or pathway to get to the top of Singleton Hill. Um, and I think that that really echoes some of the points that Alison was picking up about. Maybe we just need to move fast and have a go at doing a few things and do a few temporary measures that might that might help. Um, where next do you want to go, Dan? Might actually be good to to hear from Artemis on some of these points that she's been addressing. I think that that question about expecting developers to deliver 10% biodiversity net gain from Leslie is one to just elaborate on. Um, there's also a question here about woodlands and green spaces on the periphery of new developments. Um, they're already heavily used by humans. Will there be more effective demarcation of conflicting outdoor demands with the new communities? I think that's an interesting one to try to tackle. Um, if Artemis, did you want to did you want to elaborate on some of the ones you've already responded to here? Um, hi, hi everybody. Um, I'm Artemis Christoffi, um, Strategic Planning um, Applications Manager overseeing <coughs> delivery of the South Ashford Garden Community. Um, yeah, I'm happy to answer any queries. I've been trying madly to type away at the same time and listen in and answer a few of those queries, which I hope I hope I have. Um, in terms of the biodiversity <coughs> net gain, <coughs> excuse me, um, for the wider South Ashford Garden community. A lot of these measures have been included and incorporated within submitted environmental statements, whether, whether, whereas they, where, whether they're by Chilmington that was approved to outline <coughs> and we're now dealing with the details of those, or whether they are pending uh, decisions such as on uh, Court Lodge and Kings North Green um, and as I very quickly typed in there obviously um, as the local planning authority we are obliged to um, mitigate against um, any um, measures that come forward and impose those through planning conditions and via section 106 legal agreements which we then can um, oversee and enforce as necessary as detailed planning applications come forward. That helps. And I think there's a there's a there's a good point here about how how do we then <coughs> mitigate the impact uh, of the increasing recreational pressure and wildlife habitats outside of the South Ashford Garden Red Line. This might not be more, so much for you, Artemis, but maybe for one of our other colleagues here, but thinking about um, when we plan large communities like this, we, we do try to mitigate within the Red Line, but are we also looking beyond the Red Line? Yeah, I mean, with many um, major developments, these things are looked at um, within environmental statements. So, so we look at um, the implications within, let's say, the red line boundaries, but also the sort of impacts surrounding that and how those may be mitigated and accommodated. So mitigation measures are normally put in place um, to try and sort of anticipate um, things sort of spreading out over the, the, the red line boundaries. But, you know, um, a lot of these come in the detail and progress through the reserved matter and detailed planning applications. And as things start getting built out, then um, the onus is on the developers and applicants to continuously monitor the situations and adapt um, circumstances as they go along, which often may lead to minor amendments to schemes coming forward and us reanalyzing um, the mitigation measures that may have been put in place at outline stage and adapt as we go along. 
Then there's uh, another one. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Nikki, did you want to come in? I was just going to, um, I was on mute before, so no one heard me talk. So sorry about that. <laughs> try, try again. Um, it happens all the time. <laughs> I've completely forgotten. I was just going to see if I could jump in quickly on the um, topic of biodiversity net gain, um, just because that forms a huge body of my day to day working life at the moment. Um, and it was just, it's an there's an interesting opportunity here with this garden community because um, I think as Artemis was saying, you've got different developments at different stages, um, some of which have been approved and some have outlined, some are sort of going through the process at the moment. Um, and perhaps there's an opportunity here for there to be a sort of overarching um, sort of whether that's council led or um, garden community led um, sort of biodiversity net gain strategy to s identify across the garden community where these gains would bring the greatest benefits for wildlife um, and you'll have to forgive me I know that you mentioned that that was that sort of the developers were already working on that with um, Court Lodge and um, Kings North green um, but it's sort of working through those uh, metric calculations and if um, the developer can be guided by an overarching strategy then um, that could sort of be sort of really positive in achieve, uh, achieving the greatest gains across the whole garden community um, so I'll, I'll have to try and make sure I'm up to date with um, with any of those metrics and things that are available at the moment because I've not not come across them yet. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for that. Um, just going to slight, slightly shift the emphasis there. And uh, Yolanda has been uh, quite prolific uh, on, on the questions as well. Um, she asked a question about whether the government white paper that's going through will affect the community involvement with SAGC. I don't think it will. Um, I don't know if Dan or Artemis has any views on whether they, the proposed government white paper will do, but I suspect Chilmington is well advanced in the planning process, so it probably won't be affected by that. Um, so if I just jump in very quickly there, um, please obviously, do. Uh, obviously that the, the white papers at consul still at consultation stage at the moment. So um, from what I understand of it, obviously they're waiting for those responses to come out, come back to government, and then that that will all be assessed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's very unlikely anything will happen in reality and sort of be spread out to the planning world um, until minimum 2024, maybe as far as 2026. Obviously, the Chilmington project and the wider South Africa garden community is advanced and it's very unlikely that it will have um, much impact on um, anything coming forward from central government. Perhaps in the future, obviously, as local plans will have to change and adapt to the new protocols, um, anything that happens from there on, we'll, we'll sort of have to take that into consideration. OK, that's wonderful. Thank I, you, Artemis. No um, ben, I saw Alison had her hand raised there. Go for Alison. Maybe muted. Yeah, she is. Right. Yeah. Um, one of the things that's um, concerning me is is residents understanding of the difference between what we're talking about today and the two um, current planning applications that are going through Kings North Green and Court Lodge, um, because I'm trying to persuade them that it's really important that they put forward their voice, their thoughts, their ideas. And yet these are two separate activities. And I'm just wondering how Ashford is going to be presenting what you're finding um, with regard to the discussion on um, Garden Village and the two formal processes that Artemis has just been referring to with regard to Court Lodge and Kings North Green, because they're, they're, they're similar, but they are not the same and they will be running in slightly different furrows. And I think we need to be explaining to the community those differences. Um, I don't know if perhaps Sally Ann's probably the best, more expert at, at sort of dealing with the wider South Africa community, but the expectation is that at some point 
those separate red line boundaries, so to speak, that cover Court Lodge and Kings North Green will all merge and become one with Chilmington so that it is encompassed as one entity and become fully the South Ashford Garden village or garden community as it will be known. Um, at the moment, as you're aware, they're, they're dealt with it as separate entities, but we are looking at them as one, even as now, from now, though they may have variations in slightly in character. Okay. The I just idea think it, is that they will be joined. I, I think that's one of the reasons for the strategy, Alison, is yep. it's providing that connectivity ac across the whole geographical space. So whilst this planning system is a process and a very important process, and we're using that already because um, we're kind of playing catch up a little bit here with the strategy and vision. Um, we're using uh, the planning process through the Section 106 agreement to make sure that we're capturing some of the principles that the community are already talking about so that we don't miss those opportunities through the um, Section 106 agreement. And the strategy really is that binding tool that you know, once we've got those planning permissions in place, um, we hope that um, we can work with our partners to bring you know, the aspirations of the community to reality. The reason I raise it is that when you read our chat lines, you know, Keep Kings North Rural, you get an awful lot of negativity, you know, that, you know, it's already done, it's a, it's a done deal and all that kind of stuff. And what I wanted to do was to encourage residents to still engage and participate. And so I think that's an important message that we might want to get out so that yeah. so that, that people understand from the existing community that it's really important to engage in this particular discussion. Absolutely, um, point taken. Um, of course, the, the site allocations for Kings North Green and Court Lodge are in the local plan already, um, but those sites have to go through the formal planning process to be given permission to build. But that's the beauty of being a garden community and having that status is that there is an expectation um, for all of us to, to do more. And that capacity funding that the government provides us with allows us to do more both across the planning service, who Dan and I work very closely with, and with our community partners and wider partners of Kent County Council and Homes England. Um, and the residents are always at the core for us. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, I just um, I'm going to change the subject a little bit. Dr Jim Kelly's been putting things on about healthcare, and I think um, I'm going to reach the limit of our technology today because I, I've sort of posed a question back to him um, on this one. And, and really, I think for me, it's an interesting point about what kind of healthcare facilities there are. I know within Chilmington, there's space allocated for health provision. Um, and I think that hasn't been defined yet. And I think we haven't had that discussion with the, with the um, health providers yet. Sally Anna can correct me in a minute on that. But I think really the, the challenge back is that, you know, if we have this COVID situation that goes on for a year, um, you know, what does a GP surgery or some form of health hub look like in, um, in, in a COVID safe environment? Um, trying to get a doctor's appointment or uh, see a dentist these days is quite difficult because of uh, the facility, the, the measures that we need to put in place. Um, G GPs have been doing an awful lot of their um, consultations by um, telephone or um, other secure video conferencing methodology. I don't know what the platform is, but there is one out there. Um, and I really, uh, uh, you know, I really wonder when we're planning for a health facility, what are we planning for? I don't quite know um, what we're looking for. So if Jim wants to write something in response to my question on that, that would be great. Um, Sal, do you want to just fill, fill us in where we are on the um, health facility? Um, so at Chilmington Green, um, within the Section 106 uh, agreement, which is, um, sorry if we're talking planning language here and people don't understand what the Section 106 agreement is, that's the, that's the contract between the council and the developers to deliver community infrastructure as part of any new housing estate. Um, there is... Uh, Uh, did someone okay, mute muted, yourself? Sorry. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't mute myself. <laughs> There's a mass muting. <laughs> um, maybe Dan's doing something in the background. It might have been me, does. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I've just talked too much. He's telling me to be quiet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I've lost my train of thought. So uh, at Chilmington, within the Section 106 agreement, there is um, a clause that dictates that the developers have to provide um, space for up to HGP surgery or equivalent and, and we did that purposefully because 
the health census, uh, the health provision um, across the country is changing rapidly and we weren't sure that in 10, 15 years time when, when that um, facility got built, what we might need. So we used the formulas that are available to us to generate um, a space that we can then decide with the CCG um, further down the line what is actually required. Now that space is currently within the community hub building right at the heart of the district centre and will sit alongside um, community spaces as such as indoor sports halls, uh, it's where the CMO office will um, reside, there's going to be a cafe, a library area, early learning, adult learning, youth space, so it really is a multifunctional space and I know Jim's got some concerns about that. But I think what is really important to note at this point is we do have an allocation and we do have a space that we can work with. Um, I don't know whether Jim has come back at all. Uh, uh, Jim has come back actually, um, and I think um, I, I think his comments is really, is really valid because uh, I think whilst uh, COVID will have um, an impact on um, the way we deliver healthcare with, with, with perhaps less face to face, there will still be some need for face to face. So I think really that actually kind of poses us a challenge um, with this uh, with this area uh, uh, and the uh, provision of health facilities in this new development because we get a chance to design a brand new facility that's right, that's fit for um the 2020s isn't it and i think that's the challenge of actually identifying what is fit for the 2020s what does that look like what shape does that take um and maybe it's a little early you know we might be a year too early to decide what a, what what that will what will that that will need to look like because we haven't quite decided what that new i hate this term new normal um is um and so maybe with that, maybe there's a bit where we just need to kind of um pause and reflect on that one but thank you very much for your response jim Dan, have you picked up any other questions you think we need to respond on? Um, I think we've covered quite a few of them and forgive me if we've missed anything off, but seeing that we're, we're at time, um, I, I think I'd suggest we um, make a few more announcements and wrap up. OK, what announcements do I have to make? Have we, have we done poll C? I'm, I seem to have neglected the polls, Dan. It's OK, we'll forgive you. And hopefully, <laughs> hopefully we'll find a bit a better system for next time. But those polls will um, I think what we'll do is we'll just put the links to those through an email to everyone that attended um, so that you can fill, fill them out again in, in your own leisure uh, just just for the sake of ease. Um, but for now, I will I think just remind everyone that we do have a survey running till the 2nd of October. And um, that's I think up, up on screen. Um, and that we of course, you know, this is this is about shaping this vision and, and strategy for the garden community, which we hope to be drafting in the in the coming weeks, and we will be sharing that with you for further feedback. So so it's really just just a part of a long process together. OK, wonderful. Thank you, Dan. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm reaching the end of my multitasking, trying to read questions, focus on that and have a debate and read the instructions that you provided me. Um, <laughs> I, I think I'm now sort of like getting to the, the, the limit of what I, of the, the channels I can cope with. Well, I so think we're that... in the wrong profession, Ben. We really should move into radio producing here. Um, yes, maybe um, or maybe not. I think we'll leave that to the audience <laughs> to decide, shall we? Um, uh, does that move us on to close then? Yes. All right. OK, so um, I know um, a couple of the speakers have had to already leave um, and, and do various uh, they go back to their day jobs and and um, and I would like to thank them uh, for, for their participation. Thank all uh, all speakers for their effort they put in today um, and, um, and and indeed um, thank all the people on the chat um, for their input as well. Um, I think actually it's been a really enjoyable event and I think we've actually um, reached out and um, made contact with a lot of you and um, and got a lot of really good ideas and feedback on this which I'm sure we'll be digesting over the coming days and weeks um, and I think really we do want to um, plug the consultation event again um, on, on the website. Um, I think it's only about nine questions to fill out um, and it shouldn't take too long, but I think we really want to encourage as many people as we possibly can um, to engage with that and, um, and, and give us your feedback because um, it gives us a real chance to, to, to shape a community um, with the community's input. And I think that's really important. Um, so um, if you uh, share that with your friends and family as well and try and get that as widely um, communicated through, I think that's as possible. Uh, that'd be brilliant. 
Um, I think um, Dan's going to send an email link round um, with feedback on the survey about this and a survey uh, feedback from the event. Um, and I think that'd be really great if you could um, respond to us. Uh, as we've said a few times, it's the first time we've ever done this. Um, and um, so really any help you can give us on shaping our presentation techniques would be much uh, appreciated. Um, and um, also tell, so tell us what you thought, thought of the event um, and we'll try new approaches and try to evolve our, um, our concept as we go forward. So I think that's all from me, um, but just thank you very much for attending and your input and um, have a good weekend. So thank you very much all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ben. Thank you.